Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to East Central Missouri and the world, and welcome to the James Strong Show podcast, podcast number 319. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for making us a part of your day. I appreciate it. This podcast was recorded on the morning of Saturday, June the 24th, from the James Strong Studio in Western St. Charles County. Topic of today's essay, and it's something that I wrote earlier in the week, been wanting to do it for a long time. Uh, the Roger Waters You Never Knew. Roger Waters, uh, front man for Pink Floyd. Uh, depending on who you talk to, if you talk to Roger Waters, he was Pink Floyd. Uh, if you talk to David Gilmore, Richard Wright, and Nick Mason, not so much. But jo Roger Waters is, is probably the poster boy as to why musicians, actors, People in show business should just, as, as Laura Ingram put it, shut up and sing. Uh, he's an extremely talented man, smart, and says some of the most ridiculous and stupid things you would ever, ever imagine. Now, in fact, I liken him to uh, the Alex Jones of the music industry because he'll say a few things that, wow, okay, but the, the that's that's some interesting insight. And then he goes off on some tangent. You think, what in God's name is this guy thinking? Uh, compare Roger Waters to Alex Jones in that, look, Alex Jones got the whole Bilderberger thing right. And then he started talking about Sandy Hook, okay? Roger Waters got a few things right, too. But then he started going off on strange, very odd tangents. Uh, oh, and by the way, he alienates just about everybody he comes in contact with. Uh, in other words, if you're going to be an ass, nobody's going to stick up for you. Absolutely nobody. So again, today's essay, The Roger Waters You Never Knew. Before we do that, uh, there's something going on in the world today, right now as we speak, at uh, 803 a.m. Uh, Central Daylight Time on Saturday, the 24th of June. We may have a civil war breaking out in Russia. I uh, don't know if you've seen the news. And again, this, this may just go away. Who knows what it is? But I've seen it on CNN, Fox News, and the Wall Street Journal. And basically what's happened is uh, the head of the Wagner Group has reported that Russian troops bombed his base, his fort, his, uh, what do you want to call it, bivouac, okay? Because basically Russia has said, okay, starting right now, all members of the Wagner Group now need to just be part of the regular Russian army. No more Wagner Group, no more mercenaries. Starting today, you're just part of the Russian army. This happened a few days ago. Uh, the Wagner Group says, no, nope, we're not doing that. We're our own deal. Well, to get them in line, the Russian army bombed the bases of the Wagner group. So the Wagner group retaliated, and they've taken two towns, two depots of uh, Russian weapons. And as we speak now, they are marching towards Moscow to take over the government. Moscow has barricaded highways. So they don't want the Wagner Group to get in. The highways into Russia are closed. Now, whether this is a, a false flag to get us off of something else, whether this is the real deal, but again, uh, I, I, di I didn't read this on some obscure website that Drudge Report threw up. This was, I've heard it on Fox News on the radio. I've read it on CNN.com, and I've read it on the WallStreetJournal.com. So three pretty reliable sources are reporting this as we speak. Again, where's it going to go? Don't know. In fact, by the time you listen to this podcast, uh, it may have gone away. It may have escalated. It's hard to say. But as of right now, as of 8.06 a.m. Central Daylight Time on Saturday, June 24th, that's what's going on in our world. Bizarre. Bizarre indeed. Okay, today's essay, The Roger Waters You Never Knew. Who is Roger Waters, you ask? Well, most of you aren't asking that, but some of you are. Um, he's an English musician. In fact, in 1965, he co-founded the band Pink Floyd. 
1965, long time ago, folks. I mean, he's close to 80 years old, Waters is, and uh, he's still going strong. Uh, I heard an interview almost three hours long on Joe Rogan's podcast, and here's here's the thing about a Joe Rogan podcast, okay? When you get a guy like Roger Waters, <clears throat> quite often the podcast, the podcast itself is three hours long, which who has that kind of time to listen to a podcast? Well, I will listen on my daily walks. I take about an hour walk every day at lunchtime and uh, I'll listen to podcasts then. Uh, if they're on YouTube, I can't, I'm not going to do it if it's, because I'm not going to watch it while I walk. And you can't, if you're on YouTube and you're trying to listen to it on your iPhone and you close the screen, it shuts off YouTube. So you can't just listen. At least if you can, I don't know how to do it. How's that? So I'll listen to these podcasts and this podcast I listened to over several days. It was interesting. Uh, Waters explained himself in great detail. And I will tell you this, some of the bizarre things, and we'll go over these bizarre things that he said. On the, on the, on the surface, on the surface, they're bizarre. But when you peel back the onion, not so much. Uh, other things he's done are just indefensible. But again, almost nobody sticks up for him because he just, he takes a scorched earth policy with everything he does, my way or the highway. I mean, the guy's been married and divorced five times. Actually, I think he's been married and divorced four times. He's, he's on his fifth marriage, I think. But that tells you something, okay, about playing well with others. I mean, if you're married once or twice, okay, I get it. Five times? <laughs> You'd think you'd get it right. But anyway, uh, he's an English musician, co-founded Pink Floyd uh, as the bassist. Uh, but following the departure of songwriter Sid Barrett in 1968, Waters became Pink Floyd's lyricist, co-lead vocalist, vocalist, and the conceptual leader until he left in 1985. So for 18 years, he was the front man with the band. In fact, Pink Floyd achieved international success with the concept albums Dark Side of the Moon in 73, Wish You Were Here in 75, Animals in 77, The Wall in 79, and The Final Cut in 1983. So those five albums, that was Pink Floyd. And that was Roger Waters. He wrote almost all everything on those albums. He did write everything on the final cut. <clears throat> now, by early 19, by the early 1980s, uh, Pink Floyd had become one of the most critically acclaimed and commercially successful groups in popular music. Now, amid creative distant differences, Waters left the band in 1985 and began a legal dispute over the use of the band's name and material. So, Waters' solo work after Pink Floyd... The Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking, Radio Chaos, Amused to Death, and Is This the Life We Really Want? Uh, that was his last thing that he did in 2017. But he's been touring. Uh, he tours a lot, doing his own stuff and the Pink Floyd stuff. Uh, he also wrote an opera <laughs> translated from the French uh, about the French Revolution. Uh, Waters was an interesting guy. In fact, his father was a school teacher a devout Christian, and a member of the Communist Party. He was a pacifist during World War II but then, and was an ambulance driver, actually, during the Blitz. But then actually in 1944, changed his mind, joined the Army, went to Italy, and was promptly killed in battle when Roger Waters was five months old. So his father's politics and death, I have to think, influenced him a lot. Waters attended, attended the Cambridge Sire High School for Boys with future Pink Floyd member Sid Barrett. David Gilmore lived nearby, and the three became friends. Waters met other future Pink Floyd band members, Nick Mason and Richard Wright, in London at the Regent Street Polytechnic School of Architecture. In fact, Waters went there because at first he wanted to be a mechanical engineer. That didn't last long. Because by September 1963, Waters and Mason had lost interest in their studies and moved into a lower flat uh, in Stanhope Gardens. Waters, Mason, and Wright first played music together in 1963. Uh, 
Uh, they usually call themselves Stigma Six and a whole lot of other bands. The last one they called themselves before they went to the Pink Floyd moniker was the Megadeths. <laughs> okay. Um, so they started calling themselves the Pink Floyd Sound, the Pink Floyd Blues Band, and by early 1966, they just called themselves Pink Floyd. Now, by early 1966, Sid Barrett was Pink Floyd's front man and guitarist and songwriter, so he did everything. He co-wrote or wrote all but one track on their debut album, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. That was released in August of 1967. Waters contributed to one song. That's it. By late 1967, Sid Barrett's deteriorating mental health and increasingly erratic behavior rendered him either unable or unwilling to continue in his capacity as Pink Floyd's songwriter and lead guitarist. So in early March 1968, Barrett agreed to leave Pink Floyd, and that's when they took off. After Barrett's departure, Waters began to chart Pink Floyd's artistic direction in 1970, uh... Music from the Body, it was a contract uh, or a soundtrack from Roy Battery's documentary, The Body, was, was done. Now, Waters said he wanted to drag Pink Floyd kicking and screaming back from the borders of space. He became the dominant songwriter and the band's principal lyrists, lyricist, sharing lead vocals with Gilmore and sometimes Wright. Now, throughout the late 70s, he was the band's dominant creative figure until his departure in 85. He wrote most all the lyrics to the five Pink Floyd albums preceding his departure. Now, with lyrics entirely by Walters, The Dark Side of the Moon is one of the most successful rock albums ever. Check this out. It spent 736 consecutive weeks on the Billboard 200 chart. Weeks until 1988 and sold over 40 million copies worldwide. Now, as late as 2005, it continued to sell over 8,000 copies a week. Dark Side of the Moon is the world's second best-selling album in the world ever. Consider that. Now, in 1960, in, in 2006, if he asked, if he thought his goals had been uh, accomplished in Dark Side of the Moon, Waters said, when the record was finished, I took a real to real copy home with me and remembered playing it for my wife then. And I remember her bursting into tears when it was finished. And I thought, this has absolutely struck a chord somewhere. And I was kind of pleased by that. You know, when you've done something, certainly if you create a piece of music, then you hear it with, a fresh, with fresh ears when you play it for someone else. And at that point, I thought to myself, wow, this is a pretty complete piece of work. And I had every confidence that people would respond to it. That was an understatement. Now, Waters' ideas became the impetus for concept albums, Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, Animals and the Wall. Again, almost entirely written completely by Walters. And the final cut in 1983. And the Wall in, in, in 1978, 79. Both written almost entirely by Walters. The final cut was written entirely by him. No, nobody else helped. Um, now, why did he? Why was he the way he was? Uh, in fact, the wall was about Britain, post-war Britain, that had lost so many of their men in the war. Uh, and the cost of war and the loss of his father became the reoccurring theme. In fact, the theme and composition of the wall was influenced by his upbringing in, in an English society depleted of men after the Second World War. The, war. the wall, almost entirely written by Walters, is largely based on his life story. Having sold over 23 million albums in the U.S. as of 2013, it's tied for the sixth most certified album of all time in America. The last Pink Floyd performance of the wall was June of 1981 at the Earl Court in London, and this was... Pink Floyd's last appearance with Walters until the band's brief reunion in 2005 uh, in Hyde Park 24 years later. Now, in March 1983, the last Pink Floyd album with Waters, the final cut, was released. It was subtitled <laughs> A Requiem for the Post-War Dream by Rogers Waters, Roger Waters, performed by Pink Floyd. Rogers wrote all the album's lyrics and music. In fact, his lyrics were critical of the Conservative Party government of the day and mentioned Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in particular. 
At the time, Gilmore did not have any new material, so he asked Waters, hey, hold off till I can get some new songs. Waters said no. In fact, according to Nick Mason, one of the band members, after power struggles within the band and creative arguments about the album, Gilmore's name disappeared from the production credits, even though he retained his pay. Rolling Stone magazine gave the album five stars with Kurt Loder, Rolling Stone reviewist, describing it as a superlative achievement and art rock's crowning masterpiece. Kurt Loder viewed the work as essentially a Roger Waters solo album. Now, Amidst creative differences, Pink Floyd or Waters left Pink Floyd in uh, 1985 and began a legal battle with the band regarding their continued use of the name and material. In 1985, Waters issued a statement uh, invoking the leaving member clause in his contract. Now, in October 1986, he initiated a high court proceeding to formally dissolve Pink Floyd partnership. In his submission to the high court, he called Pink Floyd a spent force creatively. Gilmore and Mason opposed this application and announced their intention to continue as Pink Floyd. Waters said he had been forced to resign like Barrett had years earlier and decided to leave Pink Floyd based on legal considerations. Waters said, if I hadn't, the financial repercussions would have been wiped, would have wiped me out completely. Now hold that thought because he left Pink Floyd by his own words, because if he hadn't, He'd have been wiped out financially. Hold that thought, dear listeners. Waters did not want the band to use the name Pink Floyd without him. He compared it to if Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr made recordings and went on the road and called themselves the Beatles. If John Lennon's not in it, it's sacrilegious. To continue with Gilmore and Mason, getting in a whole bunch of other people to write material seems like an insult to the work that came before. In December 1987, Waters and Pink Floyd reached a legal agreement. Waters was released from his contractual obligation, and he retained the rights to the wall concept and the inflatable animal's pig, which show up in all of Waters' uh, solo performances. Pink Floyd released three studio albums without him, and none of them really did a whole lot. Uh, Waters had always been a political animal, always had been, and after I mean, he was free from the, the Pink Floyd harness, he ramped it up big time. Back in 1984, Waters released his first solo album called The Pros and Cons of, uh, of Hitchhiking, which dealt with Waters' feelings about monogamy and family life versus the call of the wild. Again, he was married five times, so I think he knew a little bit about that. Now, the album featured guitarist Eric Clapton and jazz saxophonist David Sanborn. Kurt Loder of Rolling Stone described pros and cons of hitchhiking as a strangely static, faintly hideous record. Rolling Stone rated the album as rock bottom one star. Waters toured with the album with Clapton, a new band and new material. And this shows included a section of Pink Floyd songs, but Waters debuted his tour in Stockholm and really didn't draw much at all. Poor ticket sales. In fact, some performances were so poor that the bigger venues, they just canceled. Waters estimated he had lost about 400,000 pounds on the tour. Once again, remember that number, dear listeners. Just remember that number. He lost 400,000 pounds, and that was a big deal. Now, in November of 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. And in July of 1990, Waters staged one of the largest and most elaborate rock concerts in history. The Wall, live in Berlin. Now, I would say that Waters took advantage of this. You had an album called The Wall. You retained the rights to The Wall. And then the biggest wall in the world, the most important wall in the world, the Berlin Wall, falls. Of course, you're going to take advantage of that monetarily. And he did. And he he performed this on the vacant train between the Potsdamer Platz and the Brandenburg Gate. The show reported an attendance of 200,000, but some estimates said it was twice that. And it was televised. Approximately 1 billion people watched this concert. Waters was asked to perform the concert to raise funds for charity. Waters musicians included Joni Mitchell, Van Morrison, Cindy Lauper, Brian Adams, The Scorpions, and Sinead O'Connor. Waters also used an East German symphony orchestra and choir, a Soviet marching band, and a pair of helicopters from the U.S. 7th Airborne Command and Control Squadron. Now, designed by Mark Fisher, the wall 
that he built, not the Berlin Wall. The wall was 25 meters tall and 170 meters long and was built across the set, and inflatable puppets were recreated in an enlarged scale. Many Reich icons received invitations to the show, although Gilmore, Mason, and Wright did not. Still bad blood between them. Waters released a double album of the performance, and which has been certified platinum. So while he did it for charity, quote-unquote, he made a lot of dough off of this. Now, again, remember that. He made a lot of dough off of this. Now, in 1990, Waters hired Mark Fenwick and left EMI for a worldwide deal with Columbia Records. He released his third studio album called Amused to Death in 1992. The record was influenced heavily by the events of Tiananmen Square protests and the Gulf War, and a critic of the notion of war becoming the subject of entertainment, particularly on television. Now, the title was derived from the book Amusing Ourselves by Death by Neil Postman. Uh, Jeff Beck played lead guitar on many of the album's tracks, which were recorded with a cast of musicians at 10 different recording studios, and they mixed it all together. It is Waters' most critically acclaimed solo, solo recording, garnering comparisons to his work with Pink Floyd. Waters described the record as a stunning piece of work, ranking it alongside Dark Side of the Moon and The Wall as one of the best of his career. Amused to Death was certified silver by the British photographic industry. Sales of Amused to Death topped out around $1 million, but there was no tour to support the album. Now, Waters continues to tour today, playing to full venues featuring Pink Floyd and solo material. The ramp-up of his personal politics began to cloud the aura. Now, anti-war, pro-peace, anti-establishment government party is pretty much mainstream thumb of your eye in the man stuff. But Waters began to take it further much further. In fact, Roger Waters became the poster child of why entertainment and politics do not mix. I'll start with recent and then go back. Earlier this year, in 2023, Waters gave an interview in which he refused to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine and criticized Pink Floyd's uh, 2022 track, Hey, Hey, Rise Up, which was released in support of the Ukraine. Shortly thereafter, Polly Sampson, the wife of Gilmore and a lyricist for Pink Floyd, wrote on Twitter that Waters was a anti-Semitic and a lying, thieving, hypocritical, tax-avoiding, limp-sinking, lip-sinking, misogynistic, sick-with-envy megalomaniac. Gilmore himself responded with the tweet, Every word is true. Waters released a statement on Twitter saying he was aware of his the incendiary and wildly inaccurate comments from Samson and was taking advice as to his position. In other words, I don't care about what you say. Now, in the same month, Waters announced that he was going that he had received a new version of the Dark Side of the Moon scheduled for a release a year later. It features spoken word sections with no guitar solos to bring out the heart and soul of the album, both musically and spiritually. In an interview with the Daily Telegraph, Waters insisted that while other members of Pink Floyd had contributed to the original album, the original Dark Side of the Moon, Waters insisted that while the other members had contributed to it, he said, quote, it's my project and I wrote it. Let's get rid of this we crap. He said the other members of the band could not write songs, had nothing to say, and were not artists. Not exactly a PC stance with his fellow musicians. So you wonder why they say the things about him that they did. Shocking, they did not come to his rescue when he was skewered by the media on his later comments. Uh, Water supports the Palestinians and Palestine in the, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now, he's a supporter of an organization called Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, BDS. Now, that's a campaign for an international boycott of Israel. He describes Israel's treatment of Palestinians as apartheid. In fact, in 2013, Rabbi Abraham Cooper, with the associate dean of the Jewish Human Rights Organization Simon Wiesenthal Center, accused Waters of anti-Semitism for including a giant pig balloon featuring the Star of David in his concerts. Waters responded that it was one of several religious and political symbols of his show and did not attempt to single out Judaism as an evil force. Later that year, Waters compared Israel to the treatment of Palestinians to Nazi Germany, saying, The parallels with what went on in the 30s in Germany are so crushingly obvious. 
He said the reason why few celebrities had joined the BDS movement in the United States was because, quote, the Jewish lobby is extremely powerful here, and particularly in the industry I work in, the music industry. Bang. Now, speaking in New York afterwards, Waters said supporters of Israel often attack critics as anti-Semitic and a diversionary tactic by conflicting anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. And he's not wrong. In fact, if you, I listened to that three-hour interview with Joe Rogan, and Waters said repeatedly, look, I'm not anti-Jewish. I'm anti-Israel. Now, some say, well, you, you, you put the Star of David on, on, a, on a pig. Okay. The Star of David is very prominent on the flag of the state of Israel. Okay. So what he's saying is true. Everything he said or everything I've read that he said is anti-Israel, anti-Zionism, but not necessarily anti-Jewish. So he's kind of right there. Um, when you paint everybody with one brush, saying the Jewish lobby is extremely powerful here, particularly the industry I work in, the music industry. Again, he's not wrong. It's a disproportional amount of Jews who work in the entertainment industry. Now, again, while he's not wrong, that's like saying, well, yeah, you got to toe the line because look at all the blacks in the NBA or look at all the uh, Canadians in the NHL. You got to be careful when you paint everybody with a broad brush. And Waters did that. And that was wrong. Again, anti-Zionism is not the same as anti-Semitism and bigot, racist, homophobe, anti-Semite. Those are the big four that people will brand you with when they don't like what you're saying, okay? In fact, Waters narrated uh, the the 2016 documentary called The Occupation of the American Mind, Israel's Public Relations War with the United States about the methods used by Israel to shape American public opinion. In 2017, he had an interview with Omar Barugi and, and Waters again likened Israel's public diplomacy to Nazi Germany. Quote, the thing about propaganda, again, is not hard to go back to Goebbels in the 1930. You understand the, tra- the tactic is to tell the big lie as often as, as possible over and over and over again, and then people begin to believe it. In 2020, Major League Baseball stopped advertising Waters. This is not a drill concerts after receiving criticisms from the Jewish advocacy groups. Later that year, Waters said that the American Jewish businessman and Republican donor Sheldon Adelson was a puppet master controlling American politics. He said that Adelson believed that only Jewish people are completely human. I'm not saying Jewish people believe this. I'm saying that Adelson does, and he's pulling the strings. Wow. I, I, I don't know why Adelson didn't sue him for that. Maybe it's because he died shortly afterwards. Now, in the same interview, Waters said that the murder of George Floyd was carried out with a technique developed by the Israeli Defense Forces. He said the Americans had studied the technique to learn how to murder the blacks because they had seen how efficient the Israelis have been at murdering Palestinians in the occupied territories by using the same techniques. That, my friends, is totally bizarre. In fact, it's Alex Jones-like. So again, when you say, nah, listen, you're just calling me an anti-Semite and I'm anti-Zionism, anti-Israel, but not anti-Semitic because of this, 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 and that. Okay, I'm with you on that, like Alex Jones and his initial reporting of the Bilderbergers. But then when you start with the Sandy Hook stuff, when you start with this stuff, if you're Roger Waters or the Sandy Hook stuff when you're Alex Jones, that's when you go off the reservation. And remember, his whole life, he just damned everybody who was around him. Me, 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 me. And human nature is when you've got an individual who just says me, 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 when he begins to crash and burn, nobody comes to your rescue. They step back, they cross their arms, and they smile. And that, my friends, is what's happened to to, uh, 
Roger Waters. In fact, in February 2023, the German city of Frankfurt canceled one of Waters' scheduled shows, calling him one of the most widely known anti-Semites and citing his support for BDS. The, and, and the imagery in his show and talks with a militant group, Hamas. Yeah, he, he talks with them. Yeah, he thinks they're okay. In May, German police opened a criminal investigation into Walters and the Nazi-style uniform he wore in his Berlin performance for possible uh, incitement of Nazi symbolism, which is banned in Germany. You can't do it. Now, again, I've seen this uniform. It's not a Nazi uniform. It's, it's meant to be a fascist uniform. Uh, in fact, El Monstero here in St. Louis does a uh, a Pink Floyd tribute, and they do the same thing. They wear this uniform. It's 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 black, actually more like uh, uh, the Mussolini Italian fascist uniforms than the, than the Nazi Germany. There are no swastikas. There's lightning bolts like the SS, but it's there's nothing on it that has anything to do with the Nazis. In fact, Gilmore has been doing this since the early 1980s. I'm not Gilmore. Waters has been doing this since the early 1980s, as did Pink Floyd. And they're just now saying, well, look at this. You're wearing Nazi uniforms. And and again, if you've been doing it since 1980, friends, that's 43 years. For 43 years, you've been using these uniforms. And just now people are saying, well, look at this. You're, actually, you're, you're a Nazi. These are Nazi uniforms. Again, Gilmore or, uh, Waters is not wrong but Gilmore and all his buddies aren't going to stick up for him because he's damned them all. So he's kind of standing all by himself. Now, where Waters again just jumped into this total controversy was April 2018, uh, the Duma chemical attack was carried out by Syri- the Syrian government. Waters called the civil defense volunteers who went in to help people, the White Helmets, a fake organization that exists only to create create propaganda for the jihadists and terrorists trying to incite the West to start dropping bombs on people in Syria. So he's sticking up for the fascist Syrian government. Okay. Now, are you an anti-fascist or not? You got to make that decision. In 2019, Waters spoke at a rally outside London's home office calling for the release of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange and dedicated a performance wishing you were here to him. During his 2022, this is not a drill show. Every U.S. president from Ronald Reagan to Donald Trump was labeled a war criminal. And a message was displayed that Joe Biden was just getting started. In August 2022, Waters said that Taiwan was actually part of China and had been absolutely accepted by the whole world of the international community since 1948 that Taiwan was part of China. And it goes on and on and on. Now, again, I've heard this three-hour-plus interview with Roger Waters on Joe Rogan. He is not a doddering old man. He's not. He has his senses. He's well-spoken. He knows what he's doing, and he still does this stuff. Now, here's the thing. When, when you make bizarre statements that inflame people, no one is going to back you when you yourself get flamed. That's why musicians should, should sing, not bloviate about politics. Now, truth is, Roger Waters knows no more about politics than you do, dear listener. So why should anybody listen to him? He just has a bigger stage. Again, Alex Jones was right about the Bilderbergers and Coconut Grove. Roger Waters was right about anti-Israel being different from being anti-Semite, an anti-Semite. But if you're going to play music, if you're going to entertain people, and if people want to listen to your music, they're not going to want to listen to your political crap. Uh, There was a movie on, ah, what was the name of it? It had Gene Kelly and Spencer Tracy and uh, Dick Sargent, Inherit the Wind. And it was a group of guys getting a hot dog in this town. Inherit the Wind, in, in case you don't know about the movie, this was about the Scopes Monkey Trial. And it was a town in... I want to say Tennessee and the people were fundamentalist Christians and you know, the the world was created in seven days and there, there was no uh, monkey man did not come from monkeys. He was created by God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these deeply religious people were trying to arrest and put in jail a teacher who was teaching evolution. 
Spencer Tracy was the lawyer who came to defend the Dick Sargent character, the teacher. And Gene Kelly was the reporter who was reporting on the movie. Uh, this was a big party for a town and in the town, and they were selling hot dogs. So Gene Kelly had picked up Spencer Tracy off the train. He said, hey, are you hungry? Sure. They went to get a hot dog. So uh, Gene Kelly asks the hot dog guy, he said, so which side are you on in this argument? And the hot dog guy looked at Gene Kelly and said, you know, sir, I don't take sides with politics. It's bad for business. And that is why people, musicians, entertainers, singers, actors, should not comment on politics. Because, I mean, <laughs> you're going to have fans who don't like it. Now, remember I told you about, you know, Roger Waters was upset about losing money with Pink Floyd and, you know, he lost, he lost 400,000 pounds on this initial tour he took by himself. Here's why I asked you to listen to all this, dear listeners. Because Roger Waters is an avowed socialist and atheist. At one time, he even mentioned that he was a communist. Roger Waters is worth over $380 million. He's worth almost a half a billion dollars. And remember, he's been divorced four times, which meant he had to probably write pretty big checks to ex-wives, at least some of them he still is worth approaching a half a billion dollars. But he's a socialist. <laughs> I've never understood that. In fact, when I read that, I had to think to myself, okay, you're a socialist that's worth $380 billion and you're criticizing the fascist governments of the world. If you're almost 80 years old, do you need any more than a few million dollars? Let's say, let's say 80 million. You keep 80 million and 300 million of it, you give it away. You're a socialist. Why would you need more than that? Give it to those who need it. Uh, I don't think so. I think I'll just keep it for myself. And therein lies the rub. A good socialist always wants to split the money when he doesn't have any. But as soon as he gets some, what's mine is mine and what yours is ours. Roger Waters, very popular, very talented musician. But when it comes to politics, to say the guy's a loose cannon is quite the understatement. Well, that's it. We're done. James Strong Show at Hotmail.com. That's the email address, James Strong Show at Hotmail.com. Send me an email. I will send you a link to the podcast. You can download it at your leisure or pick it up. Uh, just, just download it off of any of the many, many, many sites that, uh, that you can pick up your podcasts on. Basically, uh, if you have a podcast site, you can go there and we're there. If you're not, if there's not, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure it's on there. That's it. We're done. Until next time, this is James Strong saying adios.